All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is a wonderful Wednesday, and we are thrilled that you have joined us today for our All In at NSU. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Swan. I'm serving as your moderator today, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panelists. Amazing content experts in this area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'd like to start with Dr. Robin Cooper. She serves as an assistant dean and associate professor of conflict resolution in ethnic student studies at the NSU Holmos College of Arts and Sciences. She's also the chair of the NSU's Inclusion and Diversity Council. Throughout her research expertise, she focuses on identity-based conflict, cross-cultural conflict resolution, collaborative practices in organizational context. She has facilitated many conversations in our NSU community related to diversity and inclusion. So thank you, Dr. Cooper, for being here today. Next, Tamara Rodriguez is an entrepreneur with over 20 years experience in accounting and finance. She's worked in the public and private sectors and ranging from various industries to technology and media. In 2010, she started her own practice when she needed to focus her schedule and flexibility on raising two beautiful young girls while fulfilling her philanthropic duties. A passion from which her grandfather instilled at a young age. She is an author of two children's books, one which opens the door for families to discuss difficult subjects. She shares her experience and knowledge in her monthly blog, A Cup of Tea, offering quick tips on self-care, self-fulfillment, especially for women on the go. She serves as a board member on local organizations and contributes her time focusing on areas including strengthening South Florida's Haitian community, breast cancer research, and creating a diverse and inclusive initiatives in schools. Please see our NSU All In website for further story and information and a wonderful family photo. She's gonna give her expertise and her thoughts today as part of our panel. Next, we have Michael DeMoss, soon to be Dr. DeMoss. He's a South Florida native working in higher education in looking at programming, student organization support and leadership development. As our Assistant Director of Student Affairs for regional campuses, he works for a multitude of students from different backgrounds, ages, and ethnicities. We're thrilled to have him here as he is working on his doctorate in inclusive initiatives in schools. So thank you to all three of you for serving on our panel today. I also would like to share some resources that we have at Nova Southeastern University before we get into the conversation. As I mentioned, Dr. Cooper is the founder and initial chair for the Inclusion and Diversity Council. You can jot that website there. The Multicultural Affairs Committee is led by Dr. Terry Morrow Nelson, and it has branched out over the past decade looking at different areas on campus that we can serve our students and our employees. Finally, new to this shared family of resources established within the last year by Dr. President Hanbury, our Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. We are again excited to share the panel and discussion today. Just briefly want to go over some definitions. When we talk about diversity, it's not limited to race, ethnicity, culture, religion, philosophy, gender, physical, socioeconomic status, age, and sexual orientation. Diversity is a wide ranging topic. And while we'll dive into some of the questions today that some of you sent early and some that the panelists have prepared. We want to highlight that question feature on this webinar for you to ask questions during this live panel to engage with our experts today. Before we move to the next slide, I want you to think about your first bike. Was it a Hot Wheels? Mine was red and it had training wheels on it. 
as a faculty member, I talk and use this next slide in some of the lectures. It is a good infographic to talk about the difference between equality and equity. So thinking back to that first bike that you had, it wasn't a one size fits all. And when we look at equality in conversations, it's not about one size fits all. It's about creating an environment that really establishes equity. You again can see in this infographic the different sizes and shapes and needs of the individuals that are trying to ride a bike. One of my lessons learned is I was using this slide in class recently for the UNIV 1000. That's our first year experience class that covers diversity for every single incoming student at NSU. One of the students, an international student said, I don't know how to ride a bike. So all of a sudden, my acknowledgement of this slide being a perfect example wasn't. It's important to think about inclusion when we have this conversation. How can I include all of the students in the conversation in the class? Maybe the bike example wasn't perfect, so I'm gonna have to find another one. But looking at one NSU, not just our philosophy, but the core values that the president established in 2020 and all of the outcomes and programming and really community involvement that we have. When we look at diversity by the numbers, this was one of the questions that was submitted early to our panelists. So if you go to the 2020 NSU fact book, we do collect the stats and data. And the information provided in this slide is only the students. It is not our employee base. So when we look at the numbers and the details from what we've got going on here, there is not one demographic by race that is over 50%. No one is in the majority. And so what a blessing in the environment, as you can see in this photo that's taken on our quad, our area right in front of the Alvin Sherman Library. I also host a diversity roundtable discussions over the last year. It's the first Monday of the month, and it is open to our NSU community. We talk about challenging topics like labels and language. The respect and religion conversation was huge for our entity and our community. Even looking at food services, do we offer food that is kosher to recognize some of the religious beliefs and practices that we have on campus? Other topics that you can see here, again, generated some great conversation. But that's what it is. It's a conversation. And our panelists, again, are going to really dive into some of these questions that we have ready. I see a couple of areas that we have looking at our entity. And oh my goodness, we didn't see the slides. <laughs> I'm just noticing that here. So technology is always a blessing. So I just wanna go back and show you diversity by the numbers. When we look at this slide again, specifically, as we really focus on what is not 50%. My sincere apology is that the slides didn't go up as indicated. So at this time, I want to again, move forward to our questions with our panelists. Again, we wanna go all in. As you note this picture, you receive that as a thank you to our all in campaign. If you have a chance to donate and really make an impact. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, which obviously didn't work earlier, but wanna open the floor to our panelists and our first question. So our first question that we really wanna look into is, We've used this DEI term somewhat globally. I've just taken a few minutes to define it, but what does DEI mean to you? And I'm gonna start and kick this off with Dr. Robin Cooper. 
Thank you, Dr. Swan, and welcome everyone. I really am delighted to be here today and have this opportunity to be with you all. And I would love to share a few thoughts about this. Um, you know, when sometimes people aren't sure what is the difference between diversity and inclusion. And one of the ways that I think about it kind of as a shorthand is that when you think about diversity, that is representing differences, differences of all kinds, but all the different ways in which uh, people rep represent different aspects. And then inclusion is inviting in that difference and not just to be present, but inviting in the particip participation and perspectives of all those individuals that reflect differences in so many different ways. And then when I think about the concept of belonging, which is also part of what we wanna uh, be thinking about today, to me, the sense of belonging even goes another step further and is almost in a sense, the evidence of success at inclusion, that if we are successful at being an inclusive environment, the people in that environment will have a sense of belonging there. And in my research about the sense of belonging in diverse communities, um, there have been a couple of concepts related to belonging that I'll just briefly, briefly mention because I think they really help highlight that idea. And one is the idea of embeddedness. So again, it's if you just go to class and leave or just come to work and leave, it doesn't represent that sense of being a part of the community belonging. But if you feel embedded there, that you're, you're participating in things, that you know what you, know, what you wanna be involved with in that community, you have that sense of embeddedness. And another aspect in the research is the idea of mattering. So if, if every member of our community can say, I know I matter to NSU. I know I matter to someone in my class. I matter to a faculty member. I matter to a colleague. That's another good indication of that sense of belonging, which is kind of the evidence of inclusion. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Tamara Rodriguez, you have, again, a, a very rich background and a content expert in this area as well. How do you define DEI? Thank you, Dr. Swan, and thank you for having me today. And so, as you mentioned, I have two young daughters. I am a mother uh, very involved at the university school. I'm very, very proud to be a parent at NSU University School. I am also on Dr. Our fierce leader, Dr. Kopas. I am on his board of directors, and I am also the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. For me, when I think about diversity and inclusion, I think about the environment that I would want my children to be in. And I think about the fact that celebrating and respecting their unique differences is important. So we know that we are the best, we succeed when we are the best version of ourselves, right? So I want to encourage that in them. I want them to be their unique individual self. So the world that go into should welcome that. So that's what that means to me. It also means that everyone has a playing a fair playing field. So one person should not be better um, positioned to succeed than another person. There should be a level, um, a fair level playing field. So for me, that's what I think about. I think about the world that I want my children to, to be in. And um, I feel that if I arm them, with those two concepts that be yourself, celebrate your uniqueness, the world will welcome that. So I hope that we will get to that space where it truly is the reality, right? That I can really say that to them and they'll get to the world and people will say, you know what? I love that you're different. I love that you speak this language. I love that this is your heritage. Tell me more, let's talk about it. Um, and that they are at the same level as everybody else to succeed. 
Thank you. And I, I do want to share again with the audience um, this slide. So can I get a thumbs up for my panelists if you can see my bike riding slide? Okay. So um, as we talk about equity versus equality, and, and thank you, Tamara, you've really summarized this, this slide that, again, we use in classes and think about that bike. It's not one size fits all. So Michael, I'm going to ask you to, again, comment on diversity equity and inclusion from your perspective, you know, as the assistant director for regional campuses, you definitely have a diverse population and some challenges. Thank you, Dr. Swat, I do. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I always go back to um, a conversation I have with a colleague of mine. We always talk about the inclusive university and kind of what that looks like and what we should do as um, student affairs practitioners um, to ensure that every student that we reach or every student that we talk to, we make sure that we're providing enough and adequate service and how that looks like. So breaking it down, diversity um, being the big thing of understanding and knowing as well as accepting that someone is different from you. Um, they have different ethics in you, different ideals, um, and everything is just totally different. They're, they don't think like you. So understanding that and trying to make sure we incorporate that in our events, our leadership developments, um, anything that we do. Equity, um, ensuring that everyone has the same access to everything that we're doing. So if we're doing an event on campus, how are we ensuring that whether our online students are um, properly supported to access the event? Or if we have someone that is um, a specific age rank, or how would what are they getting out of the event that's gonna benefit them as they move forward into their, excuse me, into their career um, or anything that they do? Um, and lastly, inclusion piece. The biggest thing is um, the action behind it to make sure that we're including the different backgrounds. We're ensuring that um, everyone is included as well as supported when they come to an event or they come to campus um, and understanding that we have to ensure that they are um, included in everything that they do and what they want to do as well. Thank you. Tamara, I wanna go back to you because your work in university school truly is a team effort. And one of the questions that was submitted early talked about how do you work towards this inclusive environment? So I think first you have to listen and you have to be open open-minded. I'm really proud to say that we started a lot of these initiatives before um, it became so, um, I don't know what the right way to say it. I think during the summer, there was so much going on that there was a focus on the importance of diversity and equality and inclusiveness. But we were doing this work three, four years ago where we said, you know what, we really need to create a committee to ensure that we are doing the right thing and that we are creating this environment for our students to position them to be great global citizens when they leave this community. So I'm proud to say that we started the work way before um, this high attention on the importance of diversity and equity. Um, we have a great committee of very dedicated parents, administrators, and teachers, and we get together, we talk about what we can do as a school um, to, to be a leader, really, honestly, to just be a leader and to talk about the uncomfortable um, conversations, uh, the tough questions, but I'm proud to say that we come and we listen and we do better. Um, so that there's, I have a long list of things that we've been doing, but I'll wait. Um, we've done a lot and I'm really proud of our, of our, of our school. I'm proud of um, our, our, our administration and um, we have a lot of work to do, but we're going, we're doing a lot to, um, to, to move the needle. Yeah, and, and to highlight one item that you shared um, yesterday, your head of school has um, provided support for many of your faculty and staff yes. to attend the People of Color Conference. Yes, so we are part of an organization called NAIS, and NAIS is a National Association of Independent Schools. And with this organization, we've attended several of their trainings, and one, um, one event that they have on a regular uh, every year is called the, um, the 
people of color conference. And so we've been consistently sending teachers to that conference and they come back with awesome information just to, to open our eyes, to let us know what's going on with other schools. Um, and I'm proud to say that a lot of the things that we share with the other schools and uh, that attend the conference, we're doing a lot of stuff that other people are not, other schools are not yet even um, thinking about. So um, it, it's, as far as training, there's a lot more to do when it comes to um, how the teachers um, understand and answer questions to the students about all types of things, right? About um, social justice, about systemic racism, but we will continue to send the teachers, we'll continue to do the training as time allows, but I am happy to say that we've started that process. And thank you for elaborating on that example. It's just a perfect situation to illustrate NSU and all in and the university school making yeah. those commitments. And it starts from the top, right? When you have the leadership that says, I want this, this is important. We're not gonna shy away from this. Um, some people will get uncomfortable and it happens, but we're gonna push through, we're gonna talk and we're gonna listen, which is really, really um, critical in my opinion when we talk about DNI is the importance of listening because when we listen, we understand different perspectives as, and isn't that what's going to make us successful in this whole process, this whole mission is to listen. Yes, and you know, Dr. Robin Cooper, I'd like to shift the next question to you. You know, as a associate professor in conflict resolution and ethnic studies, I mean, your research is wide and deep, um, but looking at what is the benefit of Nova Southeastern University in this space of DEI? How do we serve our students with DEI? It's a great, great question, Dr. Swan. And you know, in my field of conflict resolution, one of the things that we teach our students is to analyze a situation on multiple levels. And one of the ways we're um, contributing to our students here at NSU is helping them with that understanding and not only students, faculty and employees as well. And to recognize there are these um, micro, meso and macro uh, elements to, to bring the professor out in me. So the, at the individual level, the inner group, and then the structural level, societal level, there are these issues that it's important for us to understand. So we kind of know what some of the dynamics are, what some of the contributing factors are that make these difficult issues, that make it hard for us to understand or hard to talk and listen to one another, as Tamara was saying. Um, you know, at that individual level, one of the things we learn is that part of the reason why people categorize others and that can lead to stereotyping is a result of a psychological process, which is known as uncertainty avoidance, that it's a, it's a response that individuals have of just trying to make sense of an overload of information that they're, they're receiving at all times. And so to try to bring some order to that, they'll have a tendency to categorize people. And then at that intergroup level, there's this understood phenomenon of, of ethnocentrism, where when we're part of a group, we think our group is the best. And that part of our identity is the, under, the association we have of the groups that we're part of and it's been demonstrated that when we feel that strong sense of our group is great, we have a tendency then to think that the other groups are less than us, are not as good as us. And that can create this us versus them dynamic that takes place. And while those may be things we can address being through being aware of it, um, and address some of those issues at the interpersonal and the intergroup level, that's not enough because we also have to understand as Tamara referenced the structural racism, systemic racism, we have to understand this larger context in which we're, we're living um, with the unique history of the United States. Uh, not only the horrible legacy of slavery, 
but other aspects that have impacted other groups as well. Um, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act as a country. We had uh, the internment camps for Japanese Americans. Um, there have been a number of you know, structural historical factors that it's important for us to understand when we try to see why are there these examples of inequity today, we can trace them back to some of these structural historical issues that these are things we can tackle, that, that our students are being equipped to understand how to tackle, to address inequities in banking, you know, in real estate, in criminal justice system, all these different areas that go beyond just the interpersonal, uh, which is so important, showing respect and being inclusive, but we also have a responsibility to tackle these larger systemic societal issues. And I think we're really equipping our students working at doing that better all the time, but that's part of what, what we can provide here at NSU. Yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that. You know, Michael, I wanna go back to you. We have a, a comment in the question and answer about providing online access to students. Mm -hmm. So when we look at maybe some improvements that we've made for all of our NSU students, and I, I know your focus is the regional campuses, could you share with our audience maybe just a couple of examples on how your office has worked towards that more inclusive environment? I think one of the big things, um, in, um, it happened during COVID and you know COVID came in and we kind of had the shift of how we provide support as well as how we provide services and programming for students. And I think that as it relates to online things, we've done great things ranging from different um, services that's, that you can access online now or different um, sessions. So for example, during um, about two months ago, we had a session where we brought in an outside speaker to speak to our physician assistant students around how to support the LGBTQ community um, in healthcare. So that was something that you know, a lot of students didn't, um, that a lot of students actually did attend and students that were coming into the university and the PA program also attend, so we opened it up to them. I think as we look at different um, options and moving forward, um, going back to campus or um, even as we kind of move into the uncharted of the future, I think providing the services and um, making sure that people have access to it and if they don't have access, how are we finding out that they don't have access? Are we, are we doing this in the admissions process? Are we doing this during their advising session with their advisors? How are we making sure that students are reaching um, what we offer? So programming aspect, how are we making sure that they're, they're accessing the program and how are we tailoring the programs to their needs, wants and access as well? And I think that as we kind of move forward into the future, how things, how the new norm is now and what's going to happen, I think that's gonna open up a lot of doors and ways that we can actually use um, the technology that we currently have so students can actually access things online. Yeah, you know, we think back a, a year and a half ago where we were planning semester and summer scheduling for 2020 and then the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And while many of us are working virtually, it has truly opened opportunities to include more of our NSU community in larger events, such as this webinar, you know, reaching more individuals than just having it on the Fort Lauderdale campus or having it at the Tampa Bay campus or the other eight campuses. So looking at, again, the, the question and answer boxes that we have, some more comments about how do we talk about diversity and live it? And so again, one of the questions that we looked at earlier from our audience was how does the cultural competency and the education system fit? So again, Tamara, um, you've already spoken about some of the ways you've put that in, but I think I'd like to know your opinion here. How can we move forward to culturally competent and cultural humility in the education system? 
Yeah, so I think it's it's twofold. I think it's important for parents to also talk to their children at home. I think that's critical because we cannot expect the schools to do everything. We can hope that the school supplements, but I really do believe that it comes from home. And you hope that your, your kids are in an environment that will re-emphasize what you teach at home. So um, how do you live it? Well, first, you have the difficult conversation. So, you know, I, I didn't want to talk to my kids about systemic racism. It was way too early. And I'm not quite sure I was prepared and I knew enough to share with them. But with everything that happened last year, it was, um, we had no choice. We had no choice to talk about it. We had no choice to research it. Um, were, were they young? They're in middle school. I, I think that that's, they can understand a lot, right? Kids nowadays, um, they have an aptitude for a lot more than we ever, than I think I did at their age. And so um, you talk about it, you emphasize that not everybody feels the way that you might feel about a certain topic. You emphasize respect, you emphasize perspective, um, and you hope that the environment that they are in school will, will elaborate, right? And will be open. It will also allow the children to ask questions and will not make any topic taboo, right? Obviously uh, a 40 minute class is not enough to answer you know, very tough questions that you know, has taken our country years to tackle. Um, but you can arm the kids with certain sites, certain links, certain books. Um, so for me, I think the, the having the, the education at home reinforced with the school education is what to me feels like the right approach. Dr. Can Cooper, I jump she, in there. Yeah, yes, I, was, I was about to ask because she said so many great answers and keywords. Absolutely, I was soaking it up and and enjoying everything that was just shared, and. And one other dimension um, that I also think about is something that I refer to as building our capacity to have these difficult conversations. It isn't, you know, we may all know it's a good idea to be able to talk about these things or to want to listen, but we don't always know how to do that. Um, and it is a matter, I think, of building our capacity, um, getting, adding to the ability to get outside our comfort zone and learning some of the actual best practices of listening um, that make those conversations more impactful for everyone. So uh, I'll just share a couple of things I've been learning along the way. So for example, when, when you're having a conversation around some of these issues of diversity and inclusion, that one of the things is um, to, to not make the conversation about you if someone is bringing this to you. So if someone has come to you with a concern or an issue or a, a, has had a difficult experience, that while in a regular conversation, you might naturally just flip it and say, oh, let me tell you about something that happened to me. What's really important is not, not to do that, to resist that impulse and to let it be about the other person to, to acknowledge their experience. I think so much of what happens around diversity and um, experiences of microaggressions, for example, is that people feel they're not seen or they're not heard or are made to feel invisible. And so to simply acknowledge their experience and say, I, I'm listening, um, that must have been really difficult, really painful to go through that. I'm, I hear what you're saying. I, you know, I'm so sorry that happened to you, you know, to acknowledge that it really did happen and that you're sorry, not to try to fix it or excuse it or explain it or tell about something you've had, but to just recognize it, acknowledge it, and allow for any kind of emotion that arises, make room for that and be a safe place for people to express those emotions, not thinking you have to fix it, just to be an empathetic presence 
acknowledging what someone is, is going through and experiencing. I think those are powerful ways when we are listening and when we are having these conversations to, to help another person to feel seen and heard and supported. And while it may seem like a small thing, I'd love to share just a quick example. Someone just last week told me about it, a conversation we'd had several years ago that I had completely forgotten. And it was uh, one of my former dissertation students who's an alum who um, is a Haitian American student. And there had been a, a political figure who had made some derogatory comments about some countries, including Haiti. And when I had, this student had stopped by my office soon after that. And I had just said, you know, I'm so sorry that that was said and that that had to be so hurtful to hear that. And I'm really sorry that you, you know, had to go through that. It was just a conversation with someone I cared about, but he told me last week that after that, he had left my office, he had called his wife, he had called his daughter, he had called his brother to tell them somebody noticed and cared and expressed that caring. So sometimes I think we feel so helpless around these issues and we don't know what we can do, but having building the capacity to be able to acknowledge what's going on and express that empathy really does make a difference. So we don't need to feel helpless. There are ways we can make a difference even in these small conversations. Totally agree. And if I can just say that I think both are equally important. Asking is also important and listening is important. Sometimes there's the elephant in the room, so you feel like you shouldn't ask a question. But I, I encourage everyone to, to ask. If you feel that you want to ask, ask the question. Um, one small example that I had is that I had a friend that her son um, wanted to be referred um, as, uh, I guess, a non-binary uh, 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 pronoun, right? I hope I'm saying that right. And so I asked her, I said, well, do, do I say that he's gay? Do I say, well, how do I say, how do I refer to him? Because I didn't know and I wanted to be sensitive. And she says, you know, um, he's gender fluid. So just know that he's gender fluid and, and you can just refer to him by his name, you know, or so the point I'm making is it was an uncomfortable question for me. I wasn't sure what the right thing to do was, but I asked and I can tell you that she was very appreciative of me asking because, you know, when you're different or when you are made to feel different, you, it's as if people feel that they can't reach out to you, right? It's, it's like you have a bubble around you and, and people think they can't, you know, pop the bubble, but it, it's, I think it's furthest from the truth. Having, asking the question makes it seem like you care, you want to know, you, you appreciate their difference, you appreciate their individuality, their uniqueness. So I agree completely that um, listening is important. I also think asking can also go a long way. I definitely agree with that as well. The asking portion of it um, just gives them the reassurance that yes, somebody sees me, somebody sees the, um, the uniqueness in me. So I'm definitely going to you know, educate, I can educate that person on a, a wide variety of range of what this means, but then it also comes back to us where we have to also do our research and things like that to understand what this person is saying, even if it's, you know, you can always ask the question, it's always um, a great idea to ask the questions and also um, educating yourself up on everything that's going on as well. Thank you. And, and several of you mentioned the term, it starts at home. And, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Robin Cooper mentioned an interaction she had in her office at NSU. Well, that might be a home environment for an individual wanting to, to have that type of conversation. Fred in our um, Q&A has, has asked a really poignant question here. How do we speak to families who do not believe there is a problem with systemic racism in America? They do not feel the need to change their perspective and to teach that reality to their children at home. So if that is their home environment and the, the family is looking at their reality or their, their sense of normality, how do we approach that in the education system? So I'm gonna 
open that floor to anyone who wants to respond first. Go ahead, Michael. I'll always want to. Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel like I was talking to somebody about this. I think it might have been my chiropractor <laughs> um, about this. I think the biggest thing is. Um, when they come to when they come to the institution, whether it could be U School or NSU or any institution, I think the biggest thing is um, acknowledging that aspect of it, but also letting the individual, the student, the child know that there are other um, things that they can think about as well as see like yes, this is just one portion of it, but here is this or something to think about. Not giving them, not saying hey, I'm gonna, I disagree with your parents at home or the parents saying, I disagree with the teacher because that could happen. Um, but giving them all the options and let, letting them choose. Like, yes, this is what you're learning at home, but here's this, 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 and this. So you have to be able to go in and make your own choices and what do you wanna follow and things like that. I think at a younger age, it might be a little difficult. Again, I don't know, because I don't know that area that it might be camera's area, far as, um, because that's what they're growing up in, that's what they're seeing and everything like that. And then also going back to the things like just because um, it's always they may not understand the parents may not understand it far as they don't know what another person is going through um, and how they're dealing with it far as it could be systematic like hey they don't understand it because they they haven't been through it so yes again yes you haven't been through it but educating yourself on it and educating the student or and or the um, the child about the options, I think is the big key of laying out that foundation where, yes, I'm learning this, but I can also choose this and that'll be okay. So what I would add is that this is where there's a fine line between perception and reality, right? Just because I don't think something exists doesn't mean that it doesn't really exist. So I, I think that um, as educators, we uh, educators have the responsibility to teach facts and to speak truth and to let children know what is happening, whether it's in social studies, whether it's in American studies, whether it's in history, uh, English, we have to talk about the truth, geography, all of it. And so if we are not acknowledging what is happening around the world, around our country, um, we are altering facts and we are altering um, history. And so um, I could be, you know, you could have a family that says, you know what, I don't think systemic racism exists. That's fine. But at school, the educators have a responsibility to, to give facts. And when you have the facts, the child will make their own decision and realize, hopefully will understand that, you know, after understanding all of these facts, I assess and now understand and see that there is indeed systemic racism in this country. Right. And so the conflict at home where the parent will say, well, I don't agree. And the student, that's something else. But as educators, we I believe there is a responsibility, um, an age appropriate responsibility. Right. You have to use the appropriate techniques for the, the age, but you have to speak the truth and you cannot hide the truth. So um, my opinion is that. In all respects and in all perspectives, the truth has to be um, introduced in, in school. The facts rather, right? The facts, facts. No, thank you. Um, Dr. Cooper, you know, we talk about diversity, equity and inclusion training. Um, you have done a, a lion chair with a lot of your conversations that you've initiated and, and those are recorded on the website of the Inclusion and Diversity Council. So you can go to NSU and Google Inclusion and Diversity Council and listen to a lot of those recordings. Um, but when we look at that education overall, what would be a best practice in your opinion? Well, one of the things that um, is, is important is ensuring that students have an opportunity to see themselves and see multiple perspectives um, in the information that's being shared. So for example, when a faculty member is creating a course book list, um, to look at that book list and say, you know, is everyone, are all of the authors of the required text coming from a similar background, coming from the one country or coming from a similar era, for example. 
Um, you want to have an opportunity for people to get different perspectives, representing different viewpoints, different life experiences to enhance that education. Um, when you're thinking about examples in the classroom to make, you know, be intentional about including examples that do reflect different cultures, that do reflect different life experiences. Um, it's a way of, again, validating and giving people an opportunity to see themselves and also to continue to learn by um, being exposed to different experiences and examples that they may not have had firsthand experience in. There are some of our programs that are um, accredited programs. And in those cases, the actual accrediting body may be requiring certain aspects of diversity to be included in the curriculum. But even aside from that, a number of our programs are just on a grassroots level really giving thought to this. Um, you want to honor the intellectual freedom of faculty members. That's why they're hired. And so you need to honor that and respect that. But faculty of their own accord are considering this more and more. For example, recently one of the colleges here at the university dedicated their annual faculty retreat to how can we incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion in our curriculum. So this is happening at the grassroots level in a very um, intentional way. And, and um, we're, we're learning how to continue growing in this area. Thank you. And that, that grassroots level um, project is, is unofficial, but really taking on a life of its own as, as we look at the different entities. We're looking to wrap up some of the time here, but it, just looking through our questions and our audience, if there are any other questions that individuals wanna put in our Q&A feature. I, I wanna definitely acknowledge, again, the expertise that we have in the room. You know, Michael and his um, interactions with students as we talk about that grassroots level and an expert in listening and, and providing program and services. The theme today is all in and all together. So Michael, is there a piece of advice um, or one thought that you wanna share that you maybe look at students as future leaders and in, in looking at possibly their perspective in diversity, equity, and inclusion? What's a piece of advice as a future leader you would share with students? Um, I guess the first thing would be to um, just the understanding that everybody is different from you. So everybody's going to have different perspectives. Um, they're going to have different ethics in what they do and how they were raised. Everything is just totally different. Just being an open-minded individual as you go into the world and understanding it and not, and not being afraid to have the difficult conversations. I know that was a lot of key things that we talked about during this time. And I think that if we are educating our students and or teaching our students to have those difficult conversations and asking those questions to get a better understanding then I think holistically as they move on um, into their career field they'll be able to be um, great individuals to um, you know be the ambassadors of diversity equity and inclusion um, I always anytime I do anything as it relates to uh, programming I would want I always want to know what the student is getting out of it and I also want to do what are we doing holistically? to um, develop our students um, in the classroom, outside the classroom, co-curricular activities. What are we doing holistically to ensure that what's being taught in the classroom is also being taught in co-curricular activities? What's going on in the world? Are we, are we in the proper positions to have these tough conversations? Because these students are seeing what's going on out um, in society. And I think that they're gonna have all these questions um, when they come into the classroom or when they, when they come to different events, if we're showcasing something um, how does it relate to what's going on so they can actually get the knowledge and prepare themselves to move forward. But I think it's just, you know, understanding the diversity aspect and also having the tough conversations. I think that's the biggest, the two biggest advice that I will always give um, and understanding that we are, and I always say that as student affairs professionals or higher education, we're in the development business. So we all, our, our goal and our key should always be to develop our students or whoever we come in contact with um, to ensure that they're not just thinking something, they're not tunnel vision thinking of one thing, 
they actually have different options and looking at different things in different ways for them to make the proper and informed decision for themselves. And as educators, we back them up on that and making sure that they're making those um, correct decisions for themselves. Yeah, and you know, I appreciate you mentioning that. We had a, a recent student-led um, panel on Asian Americans and healthcare. And due to a current events, the, the students brought forward a proposal and it was one of our highest attended panels, over a hundred individuals, employees, students. It was really a fascinating conversation and preparing students to, and empowering them to start these conversations. I know we're not gonna solve everything today, but Tamara, you have done so much great work and I love that book that you have in your background that you specifically wrote for families and children to have the conversations. So what would be one item that, or best practice you'd wanna share with our audience today? Well, I think, you know, things are evolving we are evolving and we have to be aware that not everything is going to be solved like you said today not everything is going to be solved perhaps this year right we know that but we are going in the right direction having this panel having this webinar is going into the right direction having conversation is going to the right direction having a diversity committee uh, the teachers um, the students um, we have a diversity committee for the faculty and the students too at our school. Th these are moving in the right direction. So I would just tell um, everyone that let's listen, let's talk, let's address the difficult conversations, but let's also understand that we're not going to resolve it right away. It's going to take time, but we are moving in the right direction. And I'm very proud of NSU University School because I do feel that as it relates to this topic, we are way ahead of the game when we look at, our, um, at other schools in this community. So I hope for us to remain the leaders in this space, but also you know, serve as a conduit for it in our community. I, I want to thank you again, Tamara, for your time today on the panel, but also your financial contribution to this campaign um, to provide, again, some of these resources. Dr. Robin Cooper, I'm going to give you the last word here, um, as you have truly demonstrated through your work outside of your job description to provide so many great programming and resources through your research for our, our community. So what is one last maybe statement or comment you'd wanna to give to our, our panel and our participants here about going all in on DEI? Thank you, Dr. Swan. Um, you know, I've just been sitting here thinking about all the different levels and ideas that we've talked about and how meaningful and impactful it is. And I guess one parting thought that I would have is we know from research that the microaggressions that people experience where they're made to feel different, um, made to feel othered in some way, has not only emotional but physical uh, negative impacts um, on them. And one of the things that I like to think about as, as a, a measure of countering that is not only the listening that we've talked about and educating ourselves so that we're not inadvertently engaging in these but also what I call micro appreciations, where you know, taking those moments throughout our day where when we see an aspect of difference and expressing appreciation, um, those, those little you know, moments of just smiling at someone, just making eye contact, sitting in a meeting so that someone feels seen, um, really little subtle things, but those little micro appreciations of acknowledging the value and humanity uh, of, of everyone in our community, that this really is an inclusive community where we can foster that sense of belonging, um, helping people know they do matter. And uh, so I just encourage all of us to, to practice some micro appreciations today. Dr. Cooper, that was perfect. I wanna express again, my appreciation for all of our participants, you know, that they spent time, their lunch, their valuable time listening today. Um, some compliments in the question and answer box. And thank you to each of our panelists for not just the work and, and time you've put in today, 
but the impact that you're going to make all in all together at our programs moving forward. Thank you and have a wonderful Wednesday, everyone. Bye-bye.